Welcome to the next lecture for our class. Today, we'll discuss the decade of the 1920s. There are a few themes to be addressed in this presentation. First of all, we'll show that the decade of the 1920s was a roaring decade for many. Often, the 20s are called the Roaring Twenties, but it wasn't for everyone. Many businesses did prosper. People did have a lot of fun. However, the agricultural sector struggled, and we see the reemergence of the Ku Klux Klan as nativism became very popular nationwide. We'll begin by discussing the roaring aspects of the decade. The image on the left identifies the index of industrial production. If you notice, there was a slight dip in the early 1920s, but then there was very steady progress. So there was a minor recession, but really tremendous growth throughout the decade. And the gross national product increased from 70 billion to 100 billion. This progress was also reflected in the stock market. Again, we see a little bit of a dip in 1921, but then steady increase in the value of different companies uh, in regards to their stock market price. Part of the reason for this progress was that the United States economy became very consumer oriented as many new products became available for people to, to buy. Many of these products were designed to make people's daily lives much easier, and we can see that with this advertisement from GE on the right. There were many new electrical products like vacuum cleaners. People could buy things at supermarkets instead of having to can home goods. By the end of the decade, commercially, commercially baked bread replaced home baked bread. I think this advertisement is really kind of cool. It was designed for the upcoming Christmas purchasing season. They've got a twist on many new electrical appliances for people's homes, like lamps, a fan, a vacuum cleaner, and a radio. Additional products included the automobile. Radios became common in people's homes beginning in the early 1920s. Well, by 1930, 14 million American families had radios. Now, just think about this. The first iPhone was available in 2007. Um, how many people do you know that have an iPhone today? It was almost as if the radio was like today's iPhone as a consumer product. Different companies were formed to broadcast information. We see NBC and CBS, both being founded in the 1920s. And in 1928, we see the first network comedy show, Amos and Andy. It's possible the automobile had the largest impact on people's daily lives. At the beginning of the decade, there were about 8 million registered cars in the United States. But that increased nearly fourfold, excuse me, threefold, uh, by the end of the decade as there were 23 million in the U.S. by 1930. Up until the mid-1920s, Ford's famous Model T was the dominant car on America's roads. However, by the mid-1920s, sales of cars produced by General Motors easily outpaced Ford. The automobile impacted people because it ended the typical isolation that people felt, particularly in rural areas and it transformed dating patterns, prompting some critics to charge that the automobile was a house of prostitution on wheels, as young people often dated without chaperones. The automobile also changed people's purchasing habits. Hey, credit was available, so why not take advantage of the Ford Weekly Purchase Plan and you could buy a car, even if you don't have all of the money right away. Well, by 1930, not only were new cars available, but so too were used automobiles, and 60% of American families owned a car. In 
Now, many Americans are familiar with Henry Ford. Some would argue that he put America on wheels. But he was not the only important auto manufacturer, and you may recognize some other early innovators. On the top left, we see Horace Dodge, and then Walter Chrysler. Going back down to the bottom left, we see Ransom Olds and Will Durant. Durant was the one who founded General Motors. Ransom E. Olds was the founder of the Rio Motor Car Company, and on the left you see one model of automobile that they produced. On the bottom left, you see a special auto that was produced for the police. This was called the Rio Patrol Wagon. Some called it a paddy wagon. Others called it the Rio Speed Wagon. Well, in the 1970s, an American rock band was looking for a name, and then we get REO Speedwagon. Well, I guess we're going to have to keep on loving REO Speedwagon. Once more and more people began to purchase automobiles, the roads became a problem. And funding roads was actually a stickly, sticky subject because it cost a lot of money. If we just look at some early county roads in Mason County, you can see a couple of them on the left. One is Dirt Road, and that's from Free Soil. And on the right, you see a Ludington Road crew that used stumps from the timber industry. Interestingly enough, it was Oregon that influenced the rest of the nation by placing a one cent a gallon tax on gasoline beginning in 1919 and that went entirely to road construction. So what are some other ways in which this consumer economy impacted society? Well, one of the things that we see is that indebtedness increased. Well, remember that Ford weekly purchase plan? As more people took advantage of that and other loan opportunities, um, consumer borrowing began to rise dramatically in the 1920s. Notice that this seems a little bit similar to the stock market and the GN, uh, GDP uh, charts that were shown earlier. In addition to the increased indebtedness, what you kind of see in society is a sense of sameness or do I dare say conformity that evolved. Um, in many ways, uh, people began to drive cars. Well, the makes and models of those cars were quite similar. Henry Ford famously said that you could get a Model T in any color you wanted, as long as it was black. Notice this beach in Nantucket in Massachusetts. Um, a lot of those cars look really similar. And by the way, it looks as if some of those people are parked in. Not a very efficient parking system. This sameness or conformity was also impacted by the fact that people often listen to the same radio shows. You could be listening to Amos and Andy if you were living in Boston, Massachusetts, and in Los Angeles, California at the same time. So it brought the country together in some ways. We also see an impact to the environment as the United States became increasingly reliant on fossil fuels. The United States produced much of its own oil. Uh, and gasoline, uh, particularly in the era that we're talking about here. And we see some statistics with the increase of from 50 million barrels of gasoline produced in 1916 to over 400 as consumers demanded gasoline for their cars. Next, we'll explore how the 1920s was an era of fun and heroes. We see a couple of images of heroes here. On the left, we see Babe Ruth, who initially came up with the Boston Red Sox, but then was traded to the Yankees. Fans loved watching him hit home runs. And on the right, we see a really young trumpet player named Louis Armstrong, who influenced generations of musicians with his jazz music. People also had fun by going to the movies. By 1930, an average of 80 million tickets were sold each week. That's out of a U.S. population at the time of only 125 million. So it was pretty popular. 
On the right, we see an image of Rudolph Valentino. He was the leading male movie star and heartthrob of the 1920s. In this era of heroes, in this decade where people wanted to have fun and leave World War I behind, the most celebrated hero was Charles Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh was born in Detroit, Michigan, but grew up in Minnesota. He became interested in flight early as a young man and began his career as a stunt flyer and airmail pilot for the United States government. He captured the world's attention, however, in 1927 when he flew his plane, the Spirit of St. Louis, all by himself from New York to Paris. He was the first to cross the Atlantic in a plane. He became a symbol, a key symbol for the decade, and for many Americans, as he seemed to combine American individuality with technology to accomplish an, a seemingly unsurmountable task. You may or may not be familiar with Charles Lindbergh's life, but uh, later on, um, he had a child who was kidnapped and then killed. People called this the crime of the century in the early 1930s. For those of you who are writing an annotated bibliography, maybe this is a topic you would like to pursue. It was really a tragic story. A new role also became common for women. Women's roles in the decade of the 1920s were transformed in many ways. First of all, many women continued to work outside the home. Many had joined the workforce, as many men served overseas during World War I. A lot of people thought that they would return to the home. Some did, some did not. About 25%, just under that, 24% worked outside of women, worked outside the home during the decade of the 1920s. Women often earned much less than their male counterparts, even if they had the same level of experience and education. That legacy is often still seen today, as experts seem to show that for every dollar that a man makes today, a woman with similar work experience and education often makes between 80 and 85 cents. Additionally, a new image was popular for many younger women, and that was the flapper. On the right, we see an image of a flapper, and this was the cover of Life magazine from July of 1926. Usually a flapper was a young woman with bobbed hair, hair cut short. She wore a short skirt, and she might even smoke a cigarette in public. Often these young people listened to a new type of music, jazz music, and they danced the Charleston that their parents just did not understand. And many women openly broke the law by drinking alcohol, and they even discussed sex. Here we see a political cartoon that offers commentary on the changing social attitudes. In the couch, you see a young flapper smoking a cigarette, wearing makeup with her feet up, saying to her mother, when you were a girl, didn't you find it a bore to be a virgin? And, of course, you can see the shocked expression on mom's face at the same time. With these changing roles that, and opportunities for women, and a new form of music that young people tended to listen to, we see the emergence of a generation gap that seemed to be developing between parents and their children. What we'll see as we move forward is that this generation gap will appear again and again during the Second World War, in the 1950s, and even in the years, the 1970s, 80s, and continuing on. So far, we've explored the economy. We've looked at fun and heroes and women's roles. Now's the time to look at politics. During the 1920s, we see the real dominance of the Republican Party as they controlled the White House as well as Congress throughout much of the decade. In many ways, what they wanted to do was to support pro-business policies, and uh, that was pretty consistent throughout the decade. 
The president at the beginning of the decade is shown here, along with his dog. This is Warren Harding, who was president from 1921 to 23. He had been a journalist, and he was also engaged in politics. He had been a senator from Ohio. He also was known to enjoy a good drink of whiskey and often played poker at the White House. This was in an era when prohibition was the law of the land. He himself was not corrupt. However, he often surrounded himself with people who were corrupt, and so his administration is actually plagued by scandals. I'll mention a couple of the scandals associated with the Harding administration. The first involved Charles Forbes. He was the director of the Veterans Bureau. Uh, eventually, he was convicted of stealing a lot of money that was supposed to go toward veterans. Another important person is Albert Fall. He served as Harding's Secretary of the Interior. He allowed several oil companies to get sweet deals to drill for oil in both California and Wyoming. This often is referred to as the Teapot Dome Scandal because one of those oil fields was located in a town called Teapot Dome, Wyoming. In return for these sweetheart deals, he received um, loans or cash payments in return. Harding himself was not corrupt, but he surrounded himself with people who were corrupt. When he learned about these scandals, um, he, it caused a lot of stress for him, and he ended up dying of a heart attack in 1923. Calvin Coolidge is shown here in a political cartoon on the right. He became president following Harding's death. He continued many of those pro-business policies, like with the high tariff to protect American industry. He also supported cuts in taxes and in spending. He was re-elected to the White House on his own in 1924. His mantra was, you should keep cool with Coolidge. It is clear that for many, the decade of the 1920s was a roaring time, but there was also another side of the decade as well. Farmers faced many problems in the years after World War I. Um, agriculture just did not prosper, and total farm income fell dramatically. Remember this slide from a previous lecture? The price of corn as well as cotton more than doubled during the war. But this wasn't the case after the war. During World War I, many farmers bought more property. They had to take out loans for those. However, with the price of their products that they were producing dropping so dramatically, um, they often could not repay those loans. Many looked to the government for help. Congress responded with what was called the McNary-Haugen Bill. This was a possible solution to the problem that farmers were facing. This was a price support plan where the United States government would purchase a lot of the excess pro crops that uh, farmers had produced. See, the supply of agricultural products had gone up, which meant that the price dropped. Any excess products could then be sold by the government on the world market when those, the price of those products went up again. This passed in Congress, both chambers, in 1927 and in 1928, but it was vetoed twice by President Coolidge. Even though this never became law, it's an important piece of legislation because it demonstrated that in the 1920s, the nation as a whole wasn't ready to provide subsidies to farmers. The problems facing farmers didn't disappear in the 1930s. However, what we'll see with the change in administration, we'll see the government was more willing to provide subsidies to uh, farmers facing problems. So that'll be in the next lecture. The 1920s also saw the rise of nativism. What we see in the decade of the 1920s is that the American people rejected that concept or idea of the melting pot, that you could bring people from different countries with different religions and different languages to be together. Uh, that was really rejected. And in fact, Americans became much more concerned about all things foreign. 
This was uh, seen in a way as a legacy from that wartime super patriotism. Remember how Americans began to fear all things German during the war? And then an influenza epidemic killed 50 million people worldwide and at least a half a million people in the United States. Americans today are quite concerned about COVID-19, and they should be. Uh, in the 1920s, the Spanish influenza, which probably had its origins in Kansas, um, killed over 500,000 Americans and millions worldwide. Here we see uh, this increase in the number of deaths from influenza and pneumonia uh, throughout the 20th century. In response to the influenza epidemic, many Americans began to blame foreigners and outsiders. So they passed restrictive immigration laws. And we also see the rise of a white supremacist organization, the Ku Klux Klan. On the left, we see the jacket for a record. The title of this song is, Oh, Close the Gates. As the United States Congress passed the National Origins Act, placing strict limitations on immigration to the United States, and it established a quota system, allowing for immigrants from some countries, but not from others. This had a negative impact um, primarily on immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe the most. And it just about ended all immigration from people coming from Asia. The 1920s also saw the reemergence of the Ku Klux Klan. It originally had been really associated with the American South in the years immediately after the Civil War. However, it reemerged in the 1920s, and there are somewhere between two and five million members in the United States. Uh, it's difficult to, to identify the exact numbers. It was popular in the South, but also in the Midwest and the Far West. The Klan staged rallies all over the country. Here you can see one parade down the streets of Washington, D.C. with the United States Capitol in the background. The Ku Klux Klan was also strong in many towns in Michigan. Uh, the images here show the KKK in Owasso, Michigan. It was strongest in cities like Detroit and Flint, but the majority of Michigan's counties had Ku Klux Klan chapters, and there were also several women's auxiliary units as well. A student gave me these images. This shows a parade of Ku Klux Klan members marching in the streets of Hart. This was a funeral procession. The motto of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s was 100% Americanism, whatever that means. It was anti-black, but it was also anti-Jewish, anti-Catholic, and anti-foreigner. They supported white, Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Support for the Klan in the 1920s rose quickly, but it also eroded quickly, as many of its members were associated with violence and corruption but their attitudes didn't disappear. These images show a white supremacist rally which took place in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017. Groups of whites paraded the streets and they declared, Jews shall not replace whites. Jews shall not replace whites. And they were met with protesters who supported equality. President Trump was criticized afterwards uh, when he declared that there were good people on both sides of this rally. I was lucky enough several years ago to travel to Georgia and I did some research in one of their archives and I found a Ku Klux Klan constitution and I was interested in its mission statement. They declared that they were dedicated to Almighty God, to the teachings of Jesus Christ our Lord, the United States of America, and the maintenance of white supremacy. The Ku Klux Klan 
is a Christian terrorist organization, homegrown in the United States. Well, let's review some of the main topics covered in this presentation. In many ways, the decade of the 1920s was roaring for many people. It was a great time for heroes. People had a lot of fun. The radio and movies became very popular. But not everyone had a great time. Unfortunately, this economic prosperity was actually a bubble set to burst by the end of the decade. What we'll do next lecture is we'll explore the Great Depression and the New Deal. Well, I hope you learned something new. Take care, have a great day, and we'll see you online.